Welcome uh, to our sixth Institute encounter in which we talk casually uh, but with great richness of depth uh, to our guest. And uh, we have a very special guest today um, who's come in uh, for the uh, soon-to-be debate on the future of the welfare state, Michael Tanner, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, uh, which is a very well-known libertarian think tank uh, in Washington. Um, and uh, Mike has written about a, a great many subjects uh, having to do with social, well, with, with, with economic policy and uh, with uh, government regulation of the economy and with health care policy and with social security. I hope I've covered most of the bases there. But uh, while that will be featured in the debate, what I'd like to talk to him right now about is the libertarian movement. Uh, and its future, not just in the United States, but, but in the Western world and maybe beyond the, the Western world. Um, uh, libertarianism uh, represents, um, I would say, a kind of extension uh, and fuller development, uh, more logically consistent and comprehensive development of, of classical liberalism. Would you, would you agree that's true? I, I think so. I, I think you can really take it out of the enlightened and the idea of each individual having a unique worth and value that we belong ultimately unto ourselves and that we are responsible for our actions and our own lives. Uh, of course, you can always sort of boil libertarianism down if you want to so those sort of things that you told you know, children. Uh, don't hit people and don't take their stuff. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, though oftentimes it's sort of in terms of its economic policy analysis. It's, it's really an ethical position, grounded in a kind of notion of, of, of human nature and, and, and human flourishing. We start with first principles, and that is the idea of individual ownership, that each individual is, in essence, the owner of themselves, and that each individual has value by virtue of being a human being, and that no one, therefore, has more value than anyone else, no one has control or ownership of anyone else. And, and you start with that principle and you sort of work out from there. The term libertarian is relatively recent, is it not? It's sort of post-World War II. Am I wrong in that? that that's, that's right. Uh, I think it really comes out of even probably later than that. You're probably talking the, the 50s or 60s before it comes into, into parlance. Uh, and it's still probably not well understood today. Uh, I think uh, I know there's been a lot of efforts to kind of come up with a different branding for it, and that hasn't been very successful either. How is it misunderstood? Well, I think sort of libertarianism has this sort of libertine feel to it. People uh, have described it as pot-smoking Republicans. Uh, uh, I think there's sort of a feel that it is kind of a do-anything-you-want type of, of, of ethic. And it's not that. It's more about what you can make other people do than about any individual morality that an individual might have. So would it be fair to say that when it comes to most questions, or many questions at least, of how one should live one's life, uh, questions that many might consider having moral foundation to them, libertarianism is agnostic? Well, libertarianism is about a system of government, not about a system of morals. Uh, people can have any variety of moral values. They could have very strict uh, moral values and not believe in a lot of things, or they could have very loose moral values and want to do various things. That's not what libertarianism is concerned about. Libertarianism is concerned about the set of rules and regulations that government imposes on how they carry out their moral uh, compass. Do we have any sense of, of how many adults nowadays in the United States think of themselves as libertarians? Well, if, if you ask people, are you a libertarian, you get a very small number. If you sort of broadly define it as people who are economically or fiscally conservative but more liberal on social issues, uh, I think you can find probably 25 or 30 percent of the population falls into that. Uh, there's been some use uh, by David Bowes and David Kirby, for example, have looked at polling of people who said that they both were in favor of a balanced budget and gay marriage. And you find that those sorts of things uh, tend to fall into that maybe a quarter of the population uh, range. Any, any particular social milieu out of which people who have those 
combination of views, uh, any particular social milieu from which they tend to come? I think you find two different groups that tend to fall into this. One is younger people tend to, tend to have these sorts of views. Uh, they're t naturally more tolerant, I should say, on social issues. And at the same time, they're not big on government trust uh, in, in terms of government being able to, to do things in terms of large government programs. They tend to be suspicious. They don't believe Social Security will be there when they retire, things like that. So that tends to lead them there. The other group you tend to find is, is suburbanites. Uh, you tend to find that, again, they are pe uh, people, especially uh, who are working, uh, professionals, uh, tend to be in favor of low taxes, legislation, because it fits with their jobs. At the same time, they tend to not be part of the, the religious right, and they tend to be more tolerant on social issues, so they would probably fall into that broad category. Well, you're sort of working at what might well be thought of as the intellectual headquarters of uh, American libertarianism. Um, how does that headquarters view contemporary American politics, the two parties, the way in which issues are discussed, uh, the, the overall political narrative in our time? Well, it's actually very hard to pin down uh, to say what Cato actually thinks. Cato doesn't have any institutional views, uh, his scholars have views, and uh, it's often been described that even at Cato, it's trying to figure out what the scholars stand for is like herding cats. Uh, we have a, we're willing to have long arguments about almost anything. Uh, that said, we tend to stand apart from the two parties. Uh, there tends to be sort of a uh, mutual contempt for the two parties, if you will, uh, a belief that they don't have first principles at all, that they tend to be uh, conglomerations of interest groups uh, and did not, to, not to particularly stand for anything. It used to be said that you could count on Democrats on, to be anti-war or pro-civil liberties, pro-civil rights, but they were terrible on economics. And the Republicans got their economics right, but were terrible on social issues. Now they, both parties tend to be terrible on both. I mean, it's Barack Obama who said you can uh, lock up Americans for life without trial, who conducts drone wars in countries all around the world. Uh, and it's Republicans who uh, want to, uh, to have all sorts of pork for military spending or believe in an industrial policy. Uh, and in fact, George W. Bush, of course, created all sorts of new entitlement programs, prescription drugs, and you know the two most profligate presidents in history were George W. Bush and Barack Obama. So it's hard to pick and choose. So if you have a kind of plague on both your houses attitude towards the two leading parties, but at the same time you're you're interested in seeing policies change in all kinds of important ways, some of which will necessarily involve statutory changes. Um, what kind of strategy does a libertarian follow? Well, I think it does place us in a unique position of being able to work with both parties on particular issues rather than having to choose sides. Washington tends to be very much a red team versus blue team town. Uh, in fact, I, I've gotten phone calls myself from congressmen who say, my God, you can't criticize us because it'll cost us seats. And my response is, and why do I care about this? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it means that we can work with a Republican on a tax-cutting bill and then turn around and work with a Democrat on an anti-war bill. Uh, it gives us credibility with both camps. Where do you think this goes in the future? Do you eventually have to organize a political party of your own in order to kind of fully actualize the agenda that you're... Of course, there is a libertarian party mm -hmm. which uh, has no connection to the Cato Institute uh, and has not been terribly successful politically. Uh, in large part, that has to do, I think, with the political laws we have. The, the, for example, campaign contribution laws make it very hard for third parties. You can't raise large chunks of money in a single instance anymore. You have to have a broad base, which the parties, uh, two parties we currently have, have, and third parties typically don't, unless you have a Ross Perot who can devote mm -hmm. millions of his own dollars to it, or Michael Bloomberg maybe. It's very hard. Uh, to, to organize that way. And then the two parties make it very difficult to even when you have the money to compete. Ballot access laws, for example, tend to keep third parties off of ballots in many states. Uh, so I think it's going to be very hard to see a third party come up in this country. The question is going to be whether or not you can influence both parties uh, to move in a more libertarian direction. Well, um, under what scenarios? I mean, you have, it's a, it's a, it, on one hand, it's a very old idea, as you say, it goes back to the Enlightenment notion of the dignity of the individual, the importance of individual choice. On the other hand, uh, given the way in which in the 20th century um, societies in the West have evolved, uh, 
it's a very radical and new plank, uh, or platform rather, um, in which if, if, if you were successful, we'd really see uh, very sweeping changes car carried out. Um, what kind of, of breakthrough uh, can you imagine uh, in which we would, given the political arrangements we now have, come to the point of really on a broad basis institutionalizing the libertarian conception of government society relations? Well, I, I think, uh, first of all, we should take stock of how far we've actually come. Uh, that in many ways, uh, at least the United States, is much freer a nation than it was. People tend to get hung up on, well, we have this government program or tax rates or this or that. We should remember that it wasn't all that long ago when if you were African American or a woman or a gay, uh, this was a very difficult society for you when we really opened up that to a great degree, and even on economics. You know, the tax rates we had in the 1950s were much higher than they are today, so we've actually made a significant improvement even on the economic issues. Now, we're going into a very difficult time right now, uh, but I think we've got a couple of things going for us. Number one is we're simply running out of money. Uh, the days of grand social experimentation with massive programs I think is pretty much over simply because we can't afford them. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was probably the last major new entitlement we will see for many, many years, uh, simply because there isn't the money. And second, with the computer age and the society we are moving into now, this is a society that demands choice, particularly for young people. Uh, the, the nation that grew up on Starbucks, where you get 42 choices of coffee, are not likely to accept a society in which you get one choice of school or one choice of retirement plan. I think there's going to just going to be a demand for more choice. So you think in part the imperative of reason, in part our impending fiscal bankruptcy, and in part this sort of new culture of individualism will eventually turn things around. I mean, I, 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 I acknowledge everything you're saying about the growth of individual freedom, but on the other hand we've also had a, a very spectacular growth in the size of government. Um, and uh, so if those trend lines are going in different directions, you think the tension will eventually pull government down uh, rather than suffocate freedom? Well, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, you know, there's a nice hole in the wall of my office where on Monday, Wednesday, and <laughs> Fridays I beat my head against the wall. Uh, but in a larger scheme of things, I am hopeful, uh, be simply because, uh, as it was said, as Herb Stein once said, the things that can't go on forever eventually stop. Uh, and, and then you hope they're replaced by something better. <laughs> well, it, that, that's right, and we don't know exactly what the future will bring. But uh, I do believe that the massive growth in government we've seen simply can't go on, and we're seeing that in Europe already today. Well, how is libertarianism doing in Europe? Actually, uh, among young people, it is growing. Uh, the, uh, in fact, I was just uh, last month uh, with European Students for Liberty in Leuven, Belgium, their annual convention. They had people from 44 countries there, uh, several hundred students. Uh, so they are actually growing. The danger is that, exactly as you say, we don't know what's going to replace the order as it breaks down. And you're seeing both communists and fascists on the rise in countries like Hungary or the New Dawn in Greece. You're seeing fascism uh, of the type we haven't seen since the 1930s uh, uh, rising again. At the same time, you have very Stalinist, uh, leftist groups that are, that are on the rise. So that's certainly a potential. But you're also seeing young people who are demanding more freedom and smaller government. Is it stronger in any particular country or set of countries than others? Well, I, I think that uh, you're seeing it actually in the Balkans and the Nordic countries, uh, rising student libertarian mm -hmm. movements that are very strong there. Uh, but they are beginning to, to rise up even in the, even in the, uh, the so-called pigs the, who are down the, who are struggling. I think uh, the more, the Countries that are gradually making changes are countries that encourage people towards libertarianism. I think the countries that are in crisis tends to drive people to the extremes. We should, we should point out that pigs, pigs means snack for, for Portugal, Italy. Ireland, Greece, and uh, Spain. <laughs> okay. That's right. We're not. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's right. It's not, it's not a judgment, it's, it's, a, it's an acronym. Although. <laughs> what about the English speaking world outside of the United States? Uh, outside the United States, uh, I, I think that you're seeing uh, a fairly strong movement in Spain. I'm sorry, I'm in uh, Australia, uh, among students there as well. There's some very good think tanks uh, on the libertarian side in, in there and in New Zealand. In New Zealand, there's actually libertarian legislatures in the parliament uh, who have, uh, elected, who have as done, uh, elected as such. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and who uh, have been contributing factors there. Uh, Great Britain, not so much right now. I think mm -hmm. uh, in Great Britain there's no organized libertarian party per se. Uh, uh, and the, the Tories uh, don't really have a big, strong libertarian movement. But you have them. thought of Margaret Thatcher as being more libertarian than not, or, or what? Yeah, I think more libertarian than not. Uh, <clears throat> certainly she was a social conservative, but she never was a, pushed it. Uh, mm -hmm. And Britain, of course, is kind of a non-religious society. Uh, she certainly was anti-class structure, which I would consider libertarian to, uh, to agree with. Uh, as well as being very free market. Is there a tension between libertarianism and religion? Uh, you know, I actually don't think so. I think you'll find that most libertarians are not religious, and yet there are some libertarian scholars like Doug Bandow, for example, who are committed Christians and have written books on how uh, uh, essentially libertarianism is compatible uh, with Christianity and with religion in general. The basic idea is that religion is, again, about an individual moral code not about structures of society, and there's no such thing as forced virtue. Someone is not, if you're virtuous because you're afraid of going to jail, you're not virtuous. What about libertarianism outside the West? Uh, there's actually libertarian movements, uh, libertarian student groups in countries like China, uh, in Russia. I spoke uh, last year to a, to a large group in Russia that's trying to, to organize. Now, they face unique problems. Uh, in the Arab world as well. There's libertarian groups in Lebanon and uh, Morocco uh, that, I'm aware, that I've worked with in the past, uh, an incipient group in Libya. But, uh, you know, these are, these are countries where you find that their first budget request is for guards and a shotgun, uh, you know, not, not necessarily for uh, Hayek. Uh, one of the very interesting things, of course, is that first the Cato Institute, and now we work with the Atlas Foundation in doing this, has been translating the key works of libertarianism, including Hayek and even Adam Smith, into Arabic, where they had never been translated before. What is the relationship of the Cato Institute to the objectivist movement? Uh, they're, not, they're actually used to be kind of mutually hostile. A Ayn Rand, of course, was uh, anti-libertarian. Uh, she did not appreciate the libertarian movement, although well, many libertarians surprise, are objectivists. It would, would, would sort of surprise people to hear you say that. Why? Was she anti-libertarian? Uh, I think she uh, she accepted the sort of libertine argument. Uh, she was a, a, a her own she had her own morality, but it was mm -hmm. very strict that that was the correct morality. Mm -hmm. And uh, folks who didn't necessarily buy into the entire thing didn't see that. Uh, I think also objectivists tend to think that we are too politically pragmatic. Uh, they tend to be mm -hmm. to see things strictly as a matter of moral principle and tend to not uh, follow the politics of it. We tend to be willing to compromise uh, yeah, well, what's political get practical. By yes. inches, if, exactly. if, if that's exactly. what it has to work. I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the, the famous uh, saying of uh, E.O. Wilson, the uh, entomologist and um, evolutionary psychologist. He was also, it was a, obviously, he was, a, he was a famous expert on ants. <laughs> and someone uh, asked him um, what he thought of communism. And he said, great theory, wrong species. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether, since communism is a, I'm not equating them, but since communism is a kind of worked out theoretical system, libertarianism is too, um, raises the question, and I don't think libertarianism is as far uh, in demands it makes on people from, from baseline human nature as communism is, but I'll kind of make that clear. But on the other hand, um, it's not always obvious, uh, or it's not obvious, um, that people can live up to the specifications of neatly wrought logical systems. So let's, let's imagine that you had a, a kind of full-fledged libertarian society uh, in which folks were sort of choosing their own course, um, and you had uh, people who were in various religious communities living side by side, Christians and Muslims and Jews and whatever, very orthodox in their right. persuasions. Uh, and you had people of various sort of lifestyle uh, choices, um, people living traditionally, people living uh, gay community, uh, all, all these cheat by jowl with each other in, in a single society. Um, do you wonder whether the kinds of cognitive tensions that that might at least yield. Um, would you think that 
proposes, poses an inconceivable problem if, if one thinks of sort of a, a libertarian utopia. I, I think quite, uh, and I think, but I think uh, one needs to be careful that libertarians are not necessarily anarchists. Uh, we believe in the rule of law, uh, and so you would have structures that were designed to prevent people from slaughtering the people who they disagreed with. Uh, I think that's perfectly reasonable to set those sorts of strictures. I'm not thinking in, in so place. much of that. I'm assuming that's going to be true. Uh, I'm just thinking of the the difficulties people might have in maintaining a sense of sort of social coherence uh, in their own lives when they're surrounded by such a variety of other possible choices, how that would work in practice. Well, I'm not sure it doesn't make your, your individual choices more meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, the very fact that you actually have to defend them to yourself and to others, I think actually gives them some sort of meaning. I think the, you know, you could think in terms of countries in France, for example, where they actually have an established church and no one goes to church. Mm -hmm. uh, the government, uh, you could think in terms of uh, national uh, arts programs and stuff, whether they're really creative, whether they're really innovative, and they tend not to be. Uh, I think to some degree, if you aren't forced to actually have vitality in your community, uh, you don't. Uh, and so I think the degree that you make people actually stand up for their beliefs and actually care about their beliefs, uh, you'll get more better ones. You're, you're, you're sort of assuming that people like this kind of uh, e eternal debate, uh, contest between... No, I'm not assuming people <laughs> like it. I'm not, I'm not assuming whether this would actually happen, but I would think in a, in a libertarian community uh, where, people, where fights are not settled by majority vote or by the power of a gun, where fights are settled, in essence, by willingness to make your case and let other people make their case and you live with the outcome of it, uh, that that would be a more vital intellectual and social and, to some degree, religious community. Uh, but I think that, you know, whether it would be practical, whether people would really be willing to live that way, well, I don't know. <laughs> Another potential problem, uh, again, interested, interested in seeing how you'd uh, respond, uh, we've seen a lot of episodes historically in which tightly knit societies that were quite authoritarian, uh, while they may have failed in many respects, um, nonetheless uh, had an ability when it came to military aggression to do quite well. Uh, a libertarian society is going to, if it doesn't start out this way, produce a collection of, of, of strong individualists uh, who want to be free of, of central direction. Does that create a problem uh, in a world of rival states? Uh, well, again, uh, you know, it's not anarchism. It's, it's, it, there does have to be a, some degree of structure, a, a state of some kind. Can people pull together if they're really... Sure. Well, Libertarians are not... The, the, there's a myth of the atomistic individual. I mean, you know, unless you're Ted Kaczynski and you go up in your cabin in Montana and you, you've got to deal with other people. The question is whether or not you have voluntary exchange or some sort of forced exchange. And I, and I tend to agree that for, or to believe that forced exchanges don't work. That ultimately, in the end, short periods of time, you can make people do something like threatening ultimately to shoot them if they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, but over the long term, that doesn't produce the, these quality of whatever it is that you're trying to produce that voluntary exchange does. Would it exclude the possibility of conscription and a major prolonged war? Yeah, I think uh, Milton Friedman was right. Slaves make very poor soldiers uh, over the long term. Uh, we just look at the experience in Vietnam. We drafted a whole bunch of people who didn't want to be there, sent them someplace, uh, and they didn't, you know, they weren't necessarily the best soldiers. I think a professional group of people who volunteer are paid very well. Uh, tend to make much better soldiers uh, over, over the history. Mercenaries have actually worked very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, I think that uh, you, it forces you to evaluate more carefully how you're going to get involved in things. A large standing army is a temptation uh, to, to become adventurous. We, we live here in Lubbock, in, in a part of the country um, that is uh, made up of many people of, of deep Christian faith, um, how would you persuade them uh, that they should be interested in a, a libertarian agenda? I think Jesus didn't use a gun. Uh, in fact, he, they offered to make him a king, and he didn't want to be a king. 
Uh, he, he was about persuading people, preaching to people. Uh, I think that that is ultimately what Christianity is about, is about being a witness of your faith, not being a prosecutor of your faith. And I think that you, we are free if we disagree with someone's lifestyle, if we think that someone is wrong for whatever reason, uh, to confront them, to tell them we think they're wrong, to try everything we know to persuade them differently. But in the end, that's as far as we can go. And you know, there should be just a little bit of humility uh, in there. Uh, you know, the, the paternalist is convinced of their absolute rightness. I think the rest of us always admit there's a possibility that maybe the other guy's right and we're wrong. So let's, uh, you know, let him do what he wants to do. You do a lot of speaking on America's campuses. You travel around the country. Uh, what sort of response do you get from students to the libertarian perspective? You know, I think most students are, are open to it. It's, and I think it's an idea that they haven't really confronted intellectually. I think most people tend to think in terms of Republicans and Democrats, uh, uh, and uh, they tend to not think through, of the idea that there's a third way. And I think when they're exposed to it, uh, they, they at least see the merits of it, even if they're not fully convinced. And if people say, well, if government doesn't help some out, those who are most needy and helpless, no one is likely to. Isn't this a very uncompassionate view? What do you say to that? Well, I, I think it's, it's a view that's very realistic as opposed to the view of magic. Uh, you know, we have this idea that, okay, people out there, they're corrupt, uh, they're selfish, they're evil. So if we only elect them to high office and put them in charge of us, they all change and they become somehow beneficent and they, they know what to do and they're smarter than the rest of us. And that's not just not true. I mean, it's the same corrupt and selfish people that you just put in charge. Uh, I think that either people, you know, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. If uh, uh, men were angels, uh, we could afford to put them in, in government. Uh, you know, the reality is that uh, we need to, you know, we don't have utopia, but I think that basically, People are good, and people given the opportunity will help their neighbor, and I certainly urge them to, but that's on a voluntary basis. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Uh, it's been very illuminating and interesting. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and um, we will have another institutional encounter uh, with Susan Hack, a philosopher of science. Stay tuned.